want to bring in uh, our panel, host of Cup of Justice uh, podcast, Eric Bland, criminal trial attorney Sarah Azari, and a top trial consultant who handled the O.J. Simpson and Casey Anthony cases, uh, Richard Gabriel. Thank you all for being here. I've been on pins and needles wanting to ask you all these questions as I watched him testify today. Uh, Sarah, I want to start with you. I mean, what did you make of this? It's rare to see someone take the stand uh, in their own trial this way. What, what do you think the strategy is here, Sarah? Uh, hi, Brian. Yeah, you know what? I have maintained for the last, I don't know, three plus weeks that this is exactly the case where I would want to put my client on the stand. There are two reasons we put a client up. One is to humanize, one is to explain. There's some explanation that was required by Alec Murdoch, and so far, I think he's doing a great job. Whether or not the jury or all, the, all of the jurors believe uh, why he lied about being on the kennel, etc., is, is a separate story. But in the universe of possible explanations, I think he's doing a great job. He's also humanizing himself with respect to his addiction. I think it's foolish to think that in this day and age, people have not been around addiction, that they don't know that a cornerstone of the disease is lying, thieving, conning, etc. And so I think it was a brilliant strategy to put him up. This case does not turn on science and forensics. It turns on a kennel video and what they call the big lie about being uh, at the kennels before the murders. So this this is, this is why it was important. Did you kill Maggie and Paul? No, right off the bat. Did you, were you at the kennels? Yes. Did you lie about it? Yes. That was brilliant lawyering by Jim Griffin. And it was interesting that when he talked about the lying over and over again, and, and Sarah and Eric, you both already brought this up, he connected it back to the drug addiction, essentially saying, you know, I got so used to lying because of this addiction that I was covering up that I almost just inherently lied about when I was at the kennel. Do you think that the jurors are going to are going to, you know, buy that, Sarah? Look, um out of all the possible explanations, and, and to Eric's point, as I do agree with him, uh, addiction is not a defense, but it's certainly uh, an explanation of the behavior. And to Richard's point, look, the jury can say, yes, you lied all these other times, but maybe we believe, or some jurors, maybe we believe you today, right? You have to remember that the, the idea, well, first of all, what makes sense about the lie is that once you start a lie, you got to continue the lie. So he kept going. He set the same lie to law enforcement multiple times. He said the same lie to his friends, Chris Wilson, uh, uh, Mr. Ball. Uh, but also, Brian, the, the lie has to be material. I've had many clients lie and they were not guilty. And it's important for him to testify to Richard's point in this case because it's so much about what was going on through his head and his heart that there's no way that his attorneys can do that in argument. They, the jury needs to hear from him. You know, when he lied about not being at the kennels, but at the same time he was pushing SLED to get the GPS data, which in his mind may have exonerated him because even though he was at the kennels at 844, he wasn't there at the time of the murders. He kept pushing for that data, and as we know as of yesterday, that they didn't bag Maggie's phone mm. and the GPS data was lost, uh, much like a lot of the other evidence. So you got to, to get into his heart and mind, you got to hear from him. I mean, we, we've all been following this case, all of you especially, uh, watching the video, the interviews that he did with, with police. I don't remember him using these names this way before calling them uh, Papa and Mag. Sarah, do you think this is, you know, something they're trying to do to, to make, you know, connect with the jury, the affection that he has for, for the victims? Of course, a big part of the defense is that he's a family guy. He loved his family. He would never slaughter his uh, wife and son. And so they're bringing out the nicknames like we haven't heard before. It doesn't mean that he's coming up with it now, you know, the last minute before the jury. But there's a real emphasis on these endearing sort of nicknames because, again, it's part of him connecting with the jury, showing that he's a family man. That's a huge, huge part of this defense that you can't, um, you know, minimize. Could this backfire, say? Sarah, in terms of him owning up to these financial crimes over and over again in the sense that the jury could be thinking, man, this is a bad guy. He took money from all of these innocent people. Uh, gosh, he, he may be capable of murder, too. Well, Brian, well, first of all, uh, to Eric's point, um, 
you know, the defense, this is not the last witness for the defense. There are still more witnesses that we're going to hear from. We don't know. I mean, maybe there will be evidence of these threats on social media, et cetera, that Alec testified to. Also, um, I was really disappointed uh, uh, on, for, on, uh, uh, with Waters. I, I thought he was going to do much better on cross. He was argumentative. Um, usually we don't let our clients testify because we don't want them to be brutalized on cross-examination. But this was brutality in reverse, you know. Um, Murdoch uh, was was coming back with worse facts and embracing the funk and saying, oh, he wasn't paraplegic. He was quadriplegic. I mean, you know, he re really did not sugarcoat any of these thefts. And I think, Brian, to your question, the idea here is uh, the state's murder case is very weak. They don't have forensics. They don't have science. They have a kennel video and a lie. Um, on the other hand, the fraud evidence is very strong. They're bringing it in through a back door for motive, and they are using this venue and this trial to build those charges which are pending and not adjudicated. And they're also trying to show, like Eric said to the jury, that this man has lied consistently so you can't believe him when he's testifying under oath before you today. Those are the two, I think, goals that Waters trying to accomplish. But he's argumentative and I'm told by people that are in the courtroom that he's pissing off the jurors because he's so incredibly annoyed and frustrated. Yeah, there was this point today where he was argumentative and what I found so interesting uh, is Alec, for the most part, remained very, very calm intentionally clearly and it just made me think back again this man is an experienced attorney who knows what he's doing again always looking right over um, at the jurors knowing to remain calm and, and really not take the bait from from the prosecution when the prosecutor got argumentative Richard do you think that the jurors are thinking what I'm thinking kind of skeptical well man he, he, he's a lawyer is this an act or do you think they're buying it <laughs> it's hard to know. I mean, the truth is that they're looking for all these little nuances. And I think they expect, obviously, a certain performance. They expect he's an experienced litigator. They know that he's going to be polished on the stand. That can, that's why they're looking for all these little other idiosyncratic things to help reveal what they think is the true Alex Murdaugh. I think what they're trying to figure out here is, who am I looking at? Is this person is truly aggrieved? Is this person that just can't do it? I think one of the challenges the prosecution has in this case is you know to distract from his other crimes well you know murdering your wife and son and you know they know that for the most part that's going to put a, a white hot spotlight on them so that's not a strong motive but I think they're hoping to kind of bridge that gap and say number one he's he's a practiced liar and he just was so desperate that he had to do this and he may not have even been rational when he was doing it so I think you know they're trying to evaluate all these little nuances to try and add up to what's the credibility of the prosecution's case what's the motive and who is this man Alex Murdoch okay so so Murdoch but, was very but to Richards but sorry, to Richards go ahead, sir. Mm -hmm. No, but to, just real quick, but to Richard's point, I think he did a really good job in his testimony, um, really sort of pushing that gap even further, uh, we, you know, with respect to this leap that the jury has to make, because, you know, he's a lit he's an experienced litigator. He doesn't shake in his boots over a motion to compel. He had access to money. He had access to property. He had access to no, unsecured loans from Palmetto Bank. No, so, he didn't. Yeah, that, well, it's up to the jury to believe that. By the way, Eric, there were other witnesses who testified to that we don't have to believe Alec Murdoch. You're telling me that all those other witnesses that I, testified I sued for the state Palmetto were state lying Bank, to? Sarah. Come on. I sued. I sued. Well, I sued Palmetto State Bank, Sarah. I know exactly that they cut but, his spigot off, but, and they cut it but, off before but the murder. But don't you agree? But Eric. But Eric, don't you agree that the the former president, uh, or whoever it was that testified for Palmetto, said that he had access to unsecured loans on June seventh? That that's what matters. On June seventh, he had access before. to loans. Well, and listen, I mean, before it, June seventh, I want to back June up for 7th. a second because he made it very clear um, that that he committed the financial crimes. He said it over and over again today. But but there was another interesting sort of uh, th uh, theme that was weaved throughout. Uh, especially in the afternoon, uh, late afternoon, where, where the prosecutor tried to really drill in and ask these very, very specific questions, which, which confused me. Uh, it was one of those argumentative moments we were talking about with the prosecutor. Uh, I want to play this for you and, and then talk about it. Can you tell me about one 
of the conversations you had with all of these people, just one, I can tell you, you what was going me. through your head and how it went down when you sat there and looked them in the eye and convinced them that you were doing them right while you were lying to them and stealing their money? Yes, sir. I had a lot of conversations with a lot of my clients that I cared about. And so I, I will tell you that I had conversations with them where I misled them and I lied to them and I took their money. You're asking me. Just one specific one, Mr. Murdoch? Every single, every single one of these clients I would have had conversations with it's, at some it's point. Fine, it's but fine. So, so, Sarah, I want to ask you about this because I'm not a lawyer, but just watching it unfold, I was confused because he's, he's owning up to the financial crimes over and over again, but they're really drilling him on specifics. Who did you talk to? When did you talk to them? About specific documents. I couldn't really follow. I don't know if the jurors could, but I couldn't follow what, what the reasoning was behind that with the prosecution. Right. You were confused, Brian. Were you not frustrated? Because I sure as hell was frustrated watching this. You know, when you're not getting what you want from a witness, you've got to move on. But why? Why did is, they want those the specifics? Well, if, if, he, if he owned up, well, why dig in like that? I he think, didn't know, no. hey, listen, I'm speculating, but based on, my, based on my experience, I think what he was trying to do is get in Alec Murdoch's own words one instance where he's looked some specific person, some victim, some horrible you know, theft that he's committed, lied to them so that he could say, ladies and gentlemen, that's what he's doing with you. If he's capable of that, he's capable of this. And also okay, maybe to flesh sense. out, like I said, some of these, uh, some of these th uh, frauds or thefts that he has um, that are unadjudicated. So it was extremely frustrating. And in Alec Murdoch's own words, he did him so wrong. He did him so bad. Best in the business. Uh, they've been following this all very, very closely. Uh, Alec Murdoch took the stand today in his own uh, self-defense. We got to hear his story in his own words for the first time, and everybody's got an opinion. So let's get to Dusty, uh, and let's take some calls tonight. Oh, look at Dusty's got the News Nation oh. T-shirt on tonight. I mean, you're up in your game, Dusty. I am. I had to with you here. Okay, um, what do we have? Well, first of all, if the, if the calls reflect what's going on in the minds of the juries, this case is going to be hung, for sure, mm. because everybody has a different opinion on what they saw today. So let's kick it off with Sandy from Medford, Massachusetts. All right, Sandy in Massachusetts, uh, what's on your mind? Hi, Brian. I think Alex boxed himself into a nasty corner today. He alleges he remembers all the people he stole from, but yet he can't remember any of the details to any conversations that he had with them. All this back and forth, how is he ever going to convince the jury he's telling the truth about the murders? Very interesting. Sarah, she picked up on what, what I said I was confused about. She's much smarter than me. She picked mm -hmm. up on your theory right there of what, what you said you thought they were doing. Yeah, so Sandy, you know, um, that was actually something that I think backfires on the prosecutor, not him. Because the prosecutor could have asked the question specific to an instance and then let him answer it. He wasn't saying, I don't know, or I don't have a recollection of these conversations. He was saying, rather than asking me this open-ended question, ask me about a specific instance. So I expect that on, potentially on redirect, that Jim Griffin might flesh some of this out so that he doesn't look like he's got selective memory. That's what I would do. All right, Dusty.